Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 432. Memory's starting to go, George. I'm getting old. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is September 7th, 2018. George with Age Co's The Memory. That's the fir- one of the bigger things I've discovered. Also, when I walk, I used to be stealth. I could go from the bedroom to the television, to the kitchen, up and downstairs. Nobody knew. I could, you know, if I had socks on, I was as stealthy as the stealthiest burglar. Now everything clicks and knocks and pings. My ankles go, my knees go. I'm the loudest thing walking. You know, I, I'm like louder than the dog with his little nails. You know, there's no more stealth Kevin anymore. Uh, I am loud. George, uh, we took last week off. Uh, It was nice to have a little time off. I'm sorry we didn't warn our uh, viewers in advance we're going to take a week off. But you are still very sick, very ill, and your church had to forcibly put you on medical leave because you're not the type of guy that says, I'm sick. What's going on, George? Well, the senior warden called the diocese, talked to the uh, can of the ordinary, and they put me on a uh, sick leave until the Monday, the 17th of September. Um, I am still recovering from my uh, septicemia, my septus. I see an infectious disease doctor, and I get weekly injections, and I get over-the-counter medic. I get oral medication, and the medications are a little embarrassing because uh, you know my wife reads about what uh, these pills treat, and you know it treats gonorrhea and, <laughs> and all these <laughs> other things. So you know, so this little like nineteen-year-old checkout girl at the uh, pharmacy. Okay, your pills. Say, ooh, ooh. ooh. I don't think I'll <laughs> shake your hand. Uh, oh, father, your Pills are ready. <laughs> now, folks, I don't have gonorrhea. <laughs> I don't have a sexually transmitted disease. I have some infection that I picked up most likely when I was in Istanbul. Hmm. Because evidently, I had a layover in Istanbul, and evidently there was a measles outbreak plus a plague <laughs> outbreak in Istanbul when I was there. Well, I don't have measles, and I don't have the plague, but a lot of other stuff were kicking around. Hmm. So uh, I've been very, uh, when I was younger, uh, I would fake being sick to get out of things. And it's not like that. This is really, I mean, I've been sick with uh, surgical things and broken things, things like that. This is it. This is different. You know, an infectious illness that is just sitting there inside of you. That's a different thing. And it's... uh, well, six-month course of treatments the doctor's laid out for me, and by the time he's done, he'll have a new power boat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, penicillin, although it's been in the market since 1938, is still overall expansion, expensive in the uh, the uh, it's shot form, huh? But God, you know, but uh, I'm I'm so fortunate to have a good church that, uh, um, you know, I collapsed after what after the last weekend services and wound up in the emergency room. And they figured, you know, ah, uh, it's it's cheaper to hire somebody for four weeks for the weekend than to uh, have to pay his wife a w- widow's pension. So, <laughs> oh, well, we're glad you're feeling better. Um, whilst on break, we I, I learned some serious news about Anglican TV, Anglican. Uh, Inc. and Inc. Unscripted, uh, I learned that the last 10 years of hard work of my volunteer staff and myself has resulted in us being fake news. We aren't um, hard-hitting reporters delivering uh, the, the best of the best. We create our own news and we publish it and you listen to, from what I've heard, fake news. Um, I was disappointed to learn this and uh, it comes from uh, a source high up in the Anglican Communion who obviously knows fake news when he sees it and he watches, obviously as a viewer, thank you for watching Joshua, um, watches the program, um, but why does he think we're fake news, George? Desaiwa Dawa Faron told the ACC standing Did I say committee, Joshua? I meant Desaiwa, yes. sorry. Josiah? <laughs> Told the ACC Standing Committee that... We are fake news. I can't even get his name right. <laughs> Josiah. 
there are a bunch of lying liars who lie about the state of Anglicanism. All is well. All is, I, I'm reminded of that scene from the Animal movie House. Animal House, so, <laughs> where Kevin uh, Bacon. His last, Kevin Bacon is the ROTC cadet. Goes all is well, then he's run over by the crowd. Uh, Josiah Dovrans doing that, and he, Kevin, and I've been thinking about this, and I and I believe in uh, there may be a psychological answer to this, and it's called projection. When you are have a feeling of guilt or sin for something you're doing in your life, you like to accuse other people of it. Josiah Dovrans is accusing Anglican Inc. Anglican Unscripted, and he's also accusing the Gafcon press office, Andrew Gross, and the primates of being mal telling malicious lies. In fact, that was a, uh, a quote from the article, malicious lies. And the, the reality is every story, we make mistakes, but we correct them. We admit them. We get either on the air, we say, oops, that was not wrong, folks. We're sorry. Well, or, uh, or, uh, no, or we, re reprint, we we're correct to print or retract it. And this is an important point. At least once or twice a year, you and I, we blow it. Either a source was incorrect, we jumped the gun, we got an email from a person who probably wasn't a reliable source, and we ruined a, a, a story, whether it was good or bad, and we have to correct ourselves. And we do it. It's hard, isn't and, it? And I'll give you sort of an uh, When I was starting out 25 years ago writing, gosh, it's been that long, I had a, store, I had a uh, contact from another diocese say, the bishop's just ordained an inmate in prison who's to the diaconate. He's been studying, he's a lifer, he's going to, get a, he's going to be up for parole soon. And the bishop has sponsored this man for ordination and he went in and ordained him. And do you know what he did, George? He laid hands on the glass wall between the two, between him and the thing. And that was such a good story, I ran with it with one source never asking the bishop it was true. And of course it wasn't true. No. Oh, no. It, was, it was too good to be true. But this was somebody in the diocesan office. Now, but, so I learned my lesson 25 years ago that you've got to substantiate stories. You just can't write you know, what sounds great or what you must be true. You have to prove it. Mm -hmm. And in our relationships with the ACC and the ACNS, we and uh, and GAFCON have just had a miserable time because we have been subject to calumnies and defamation. Do you remember a few years ago, you and I were on the phone, we were Skyping with Elliot Wapakula, the Archbishop of Kenya, and he was telling us that the Bishop of Nairobi had forged his signature and then had sent this forged letter to the other delegates to the ACC meeting in Lusaka from Kenya, and that's how they wound up there. To this day, Josiah Wadaiwa Faron says, that's a damned lie. It's untrue, it never happened. Or we had uh, the election of a new archbishop in Sudan, South Sudan. Josiah Wadaiwa Faron went down, put out this story, this is the model of how Anglican elections should be held. Well, we were given letters signed by almost half the Sudanese bishops saying this was a fraudulent election because more people... Than, more than half. Over, more than half said that. And we had it with the signatures, and we had bishops who were making these public claims. And so here we have a disputed election in South Sudan where there's fraud al alleged, and Josiah Wadawa Faron through the ACNS saying this is the model of clean government that Anglicanism wants. And each time his response and that of the ACNS has been to call us liars. And even and you know, George and Kevin are George and Kevin, but they call the GAFCON archbishops liars. At the twenty sixteen primates meeting, there was an agreement reached. Munir Nice thought he knew what it meant, Stanley in Tagali, Uganda, Nicholas Oko of Kenya, uh Anush, uh Raja Anushpur of Rwanda, uh they all and others who we've talked to, the, the Burmese fellow, uh, Andrew, um, I forget his last name. Uh, I don't remember there. That's right. Okay. Well, We're getting old. It's, uh, it's an age thing. But they all agreed. But what he said was that this is, you know, this is what was agreed. And then it was broken 
And uh, Josiah Wadofro last week in his statement before the ACC said, people who say that we did not honor the agreements of 2016 are lying liars who lie. <laughs> Which means people like the bishop, the Episcopal Bishop of Connecticut is a liar because he came out right after uh, the ACC meeting and says, we got everything we wanted. We got to vote on all the projects we wanted to vote for. We attended all the meetings we wanted to attend. We were in the leadership of the ACC despite the primates gathering and the primates statement and the primates not wanting us there. Despite all that, we got what we wanted. And I'm paraphrasing. And so uh, is he a liar, uh, Josiah? I don't think so. Well, the, the, I think the thing that we need to understand is that the institutions, the church, it's not just our church, the Anglican world, but the Catholic world and the Orthodox world are going through a really bad time where the institutions, the hierarchies, I'm not talking about the regular clergy, uh, most of them, I'm not talking about the people in the pews, and there are some great bishops and leaders, but we're in the world where Justin Welby and Josiah Wadawa are thrown to the norms. They are, uh, they're not the exception. It has been a bad decade. For Christian leadership uh, and we're talking the big denominations let's talk uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, Francis is through his silence driving a probably a forever wedge between him and whatever respect the Roman Catholic Church had earned over the last 2000 years uh, I, let me just jump on a, on a tiny local bit and yeah. I'm sure this is replicated in thousands of places across the country I was chatting with uh, one of the local pastors, Catholic pastors, about all this, and he basically said, look, we're just going to pull in our heads and wait till Francis goes. Yeah. In other words, we basically are discon emotionally disconnecting from Francis. Anything he says, you know, we'll nod, we'll do it if we have to, but he has no spiritual, he has no... Authority. Authority yeah. internally. And yeah. so basically, if... Francis, Episcop Francis papacy, for all intents and purposes, is over for many men. I don't know how many, but for, for, some, for some people. A large percentage, um, especially internally. I, I don't know what's going on right now in the Vatican, in, in the upper echelons, what they're thinking, what they're trying to do. If, is he stopping all press? There's not been a, a leak out of the Vatican in 10 days. What, it, is he got the power still to stop those leaks? I don't know. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox. If you go in, in back in time uh, to the beginning of Putin's uh, leadership in Russia, he's always desired to reform the Soviet Union. Um, he thought that the fall of the Soviet Union was the worst thing in history. And he sought to do it. Well, from a the, Russian perspective, from, he's right. Yeah, sure. from, from his ex-KGB agency perspective, he's right. It, it was, it, if you believe in communism and you believe in, in holding together that type of organization, the fall was horrid. Um, dealing with Ronald Reagan didn't work so well for you. Um, in doing so, they want to keep the architecture there so one day it can reform. And part of that architecture was the church. We have the church of Ukraine, we have the church, the, the Russian church of Ukraine, all that. And we're see, starting to see that fall apart, George. Yeah, there was a meeting last Friday in Istanbul between the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, who is the first among equals in the Orthodox world, and Cyril, uh, the Russian Orthodox patriarch. And the press coverage out of Moscow, I wrote an article about this, Forget Religion. The press coverage out of Moscow was mixed because what basically Cyril was told is, you blew it. You've not been willing to negotiate in good faith with the Ukrainians, and so we've decided in Istanbul that the Ukrainians can have their own autocephalous, meaning independent church. It's a done deal. We just now have to get do all the mechanics. Now what this means is that one-third of the parishes of the Russian Orthodox Church are now going to be moving out into a new church, into the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Now, the Russian press has either said, oh, well, it's still not too late, or it's either downplayed the saying, you know, it's not over till it's over, 
or they've just taken Cyril. You idiot. You have let down Russia. You have let, let down, down Putin. Putin. Because your job was to keep the Russian messianic vision of God has given Russia a special place to civilize the world. You've blown it. So the Russian press is speculating that Cyril is not long, not long for this earth. <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah. I uh, he may have an unfortunate auto accident, <laughs> no, but he's not long for the job, and that a new and that some people who are even closer to Putin, like the Metropolitan Tikhon of Peskov, will be made the new patriarch, who are even fiercer Russian nationalists, fiercer allies of Putin. So, you know, Francis could be out of a job soon, if conceivably. Cyril could be out of a job soon, and if there are any justice in the world, Justin Welby would be out of a job soon. Well, you and I are about to talk about the Episcopal Church's declining numbers. Uh, I don't know if you saw this this week, but there was a story about uh, the millennials who identify as Church of England is to 2%. Oh my lord. You know, two percent would you get it uh would accidentally answer right just by accident. So I don't know what's going there are more transgendered people who identify as transgendered than go to that identify as Church of England attendees. It's no, we don't want to denigrate those faithful people who are doing a good job. We have many, many friends who are priests in, in England and clergy in England who are doing wonderful things. But the culture has been lost to the Christian worldview. And the leadership of the Church of England are not making that job for the local parish priest any easier. Justin Welby has put out this socialist manifesto uh, that the economy, the fifth largest economy in the world, the economy that has brought people out of poverty, the economy that has changed, the, you know, that the economy that's doing pretty well all in all is not doing well enough so he wants to raise taxes on capital gains on inheritance taxes on uh, high income earners on corporations and he wants to give 25 year olds a 10,000 pound grant so that they can get a head start in life Kevin I have two 23 year old daughters choose, choose, if you gave choose, them $10,000 choose 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 yeah choose. they buy shoes choose 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 yeah. choose, choose. They're not going to buy a house or a you know invest it in a money market fund. They're going to buy shoes. They're going to go to Cancun. Uh, they're going to get an Apple Watch. Uh, yeah, I know. Welby, Welby is not an economist. He's not a systematic economic thinker. And he comes up and he goes and he puts his name on a socialist think tank document that basically will. You know, you think Venezuela would be a model for people, but the socialist way just doesn't work. It is interesting, and I, I, I but, you know, Kevin, Venezuela, the Episcopal Diocese is going through a bishop search right now. Maybe Justin, <laughs> Justin. Will find his niche at last, being bishop of Venezuela. <sighs> CNN has gone downhill the last dozen years. Uh, they're all anti-Trump, twenty-four-seven. They're all, you know, communist, socialist, twenty-four-seven. But in 2015, they published a story begrudgingly, and you could just tell how the author wrote this. He said, uh, in a study conducted by whatever charity, um, it looks like America, with its lowest taxes and its capitalism, is the highest giver once again in the world. Uh, the, the Americans and uh, those rich people in America give more than any country uh, anywhere uh, he was hopeful because uh, Miramar also gives a lot of money, uh, and uh, but you could just right see the begrudgery that uh, it wasn't a socialist country, it wasn't a communist country, it was a capitalist country with low taxes that let the people be rich, that let the people have income, that let the people decide what to do with their money. When they had the money, they decided to give it to charities. That's what I do with my money. I, I have no. I'm not going to give it to the kids. They'll waste it. They'll buy shoes. I give my money to charity. Well, Kevin, I, I am conscious of the fact that uh, it is presumptuous for me to comment on the English social scene because I'm not English. I don't have that sense of being an insider as to what goes on. 
just as it's presumptuous for English people to comment on the American political or social scene because they really don't understand things. I'm thinking, you know, the, the Episcopal Church released its statistics. And once again, attendance is down. It fell 2.3%. The Michael Curry bump hasn't yet happened. And I'm thinking about this because the wars really are over in the sense that people don't talk in coffee hour anymore about Gene Robinson or Catherine Jeffrey Shuri. They talk about, we're back to normal again. We are yeah, we, back to normal. But still, well, my parish has done quite well. Uh, we grew 15% last year, and we're growing about the same rate this year. But up in Ocala, uh, actually Silver Spring Shores is the dean. One of my jobs is to liquidate dying parishes. There's a St. Stephen's, oh, had about 100 plus people about 10, 15 years ago on a Sunday. And when it was shut down in May, it had 15 people, all of whom were over 85 years of age. And there wasn't heresy, there wasn't all the things that people on the blogs like to point out are the reason why the Episcopal Church is dying. None of that was happening. It's just that the neighborhood changed and the people didn't, the neighborhood was becoming Hispanic and African American. There's a Lockheed Martin factory built across the street from the church, which is not prime Episcopal Church property. You know, you don't put it in working class factory districts. But the people didn't reach out to the new residents, and the church finally died. And as I look and talk to my friends up north, the culture has moved against church attendance. It's moved against Christian identity. It's still around here in Florida. When I go to Walmart or the grocery store on Sunday mornings between services because we've run out of cookies for the kids, I still get guilty looks from people who think, oh, yes, I should be in church. Does that happen in Connecticut? Well, Connecticut's a, a little different. Um, we get up in the morning, and uh, in typical fashion, uh, the enemy loves to cause derision on a Sunday morning. Uh, any argument that's going to be had all week long happens on a Sunday morning with the kids uh, or, or Jill and I, all the tension, stuff like that. We get on our Sunday best. We go out the uh, hop in our little car, and you look around, and it's like zombie land. Nobody's out. You may hear a car in the distance and you think maybe there's a nuclear uh, explosion somewhere and these are the survivors coming into the streets looking for supplies. You go out and boom, traffic to church is like that. I can get from here all the way down to Fairfield uh, to attend my church oh, 18 minutes and it's, it's a 20-minute ride. When we lived in Huntsville, Alabama, the worst part about going to church was Sunday morning traffic everybody was out even the people who were too old to drive were out and it was just slow going you get to a stoplight uh, stop and go traffic everybody in Huntsville Alabama at that at that time went to church on a Sunday and uh, that's not happening here the churches are empty uh, they're becoming Islamic uh, resource centers they are becoming uh, Red Cross uh, shelters they're not becoming churches. They, uh, there's no gospel anymore in the Northeast, George. And people, my, my opinion of this is that people like to blame the clergy and the church. Oh, it's all Jack Spong's problem. It's all Gene Robinson's problem. Or it's all the local pastor. He's boring. Well, that all may be true. But a successful church, in my experience, is a church where the lay leaders and the priest or minister are on fire for the Lord. Even if you've got a great priest, if you've got a lay leadership who just wants to carry on carrying on, that's not enough. Mm. It's that combination that makes a church successful. In other words, my county is stagnant, a rural south. With the people who live here are poor whites, uh, locals, uh, working class people who've retired because they couldn't afford the villages. They've moved down here from New Jersey and New York. Or we have a smattering of uh, people in golf course communities. We have no lawyers or doctors in our church. Yet the Episcopal Church here is doing very well because it's a combination of dynamic preaching and dynamic fellowship, and it's a, it's a combination effect. You go 20 miles up the road to Silver Spring Shores, dull, preach, dull preacher and uh, indifferent uh, lay leadership, you got a church that we've got to shut down. I also think the culture is a big issue here. Um, 
I don't remember exactly when it, I noticed it, the mocking of Christianity. I think it was the mid nineties. I was watching like an NBC Brian Williams or whoever was the, uh, the host at the time. And they had a story that just literally mocked Christianity. And I know this ha has been happening in college campuses from the 50s and 60s. Um, obviously, the liberal press has picked up on it. And I think the, the default now of society is to mock things like Christianity, to mock belief, to mock faith, to, to mock the, the tenets of our faith. And I think that's just going to continue, and it is going to get much worse. You, you look at the, the books like Benedict the Benedict option, you say, you know, George, that may be how this turns out, not because of our desire to hold together a society, but we may be thrown into our own society uh, without a choice. Well, Kevin, I would, even, I would up this even higher. I mean, look at the deep divisions culturally and socially and politically in our country these days. Now, uh, uh, you could talk about Donald Trump all you want, you can talk about the deep state, you can talk about the elites, the establishments, but the degree of hatred that people have for their opponents, oh, I, can't, I can't remember, I can't ever remember seeing that. I mean, I thought I saw that in the late 60s as a, as a tiny child, I'd watch the hippies on TV or the Chicago demonstrations at this. But they were such a small element back then. Now it's the default. People go to a Supreme Court nomination hearing and they shriek. What on earth? How did that become a good idea? How did, how did that become something that we do now in common discourse that we just shriek? And see, here's the joke of it. Um, in my little county, which only went 75 percent for Donald Trump in uh, 2016. I think it, when he runs in 2020, it'll go 80 or 90 percent, including the majority of African Americans. The people in this country who I work with, the people, essentially the have-nots, who are not the elites, they're not the uh, uh, educated, chattering classes. They're the working class people. They're the poor people. They look at Trump not so much as a savior, but as a stick in which to beat the people who degenerate, de denigrate their culture and their way of life. I, um, want to, I want to do a contrast here. I want to contrast the American press versus the Russian, not the Soviet press, the Russian press. In the Russian press, you can criticize the government. Sorry, I'm not sure. Sorry, Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, Kevin. I think the National Security Administration is start agency is starting to listen to your Alexa voices. Alexa is listening to me. Uh oh. So the Soviet, or the Russian press uh, will let you. They will criticize the government. They will uh, criticize people who fail P Putin, but they will not criticize Putin. Here in America, you are allowed to criticize Putin but you're not allowed to criticize those who are critics. Or, did I say Putin? In the U.S. press, you're uh, allowed to criticize Trump, but you're not allowed to criticize those who attack Trump. And you're not allowed to compliment Trump at all in the press. Yeah, it, the Russian press, uh, I wrote an article about this for Get Religion recently. The Russian press... Uh, I have some expertise and knowledge in this area. The Russian press has always been that way, whether it was under the Tsar, whether it was under Stalin, whether it was under Putin. You could always attack the court here, but you could never attack the king. Because the way the Russian world works is that the king has is in power because his courtiers, the people and lots of authority are always at each other's throats. So the Russian press has been attacking the KG, the FSB, which is a successor to the KGB, for its incompetence um, recently. It's been attacking Cyril for screwing up things. And but they're attacking him because you have let down the boss. <laughs> Whereas in America, the boss is the only person you can attack. Plus, you can also attack Putin, by the way. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, you've got people uh, like this recent anonymous op-ed piece of the New York Times from somebody who's evidently a courtier who's saying nasty things about the king. 
It's completely different in Russia. Uh, and, well. In, in what world does an anonymous op-ed get so much press? Get so in much the Anglican world. Yeah, the Anglican <laughs> world. You know. news service. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that too. Well, George, we've uh, got you back to health where you can talk. Uh, we did a wonderful show here. We're going to let people get back to their lives. Uh, episode 432 is this one. 433 has Gavin, where we talk more about Justin Welby and his socialist tendencies. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 432 of Anglican Unscripted.